And I think we should get started. I'm going to come up here and do this official. Uh, I do want to welcome everybody. Gosh, y'all look so far away. <laughs> I do want to welcome we everybody. Right here. There you go. Everybody that came out tonight, uh, those that didn't, are certainly going to miss a treat. Um, our program this evening is for the love of poetry. And everybody knows me, so I'm just going to remind you. And it is my pleasure and pride to be the manager here at this locker room. Um, we have an exciting evening for two reasons. First and foremost, the poetry, but we're also experimenting with technology this evening. If you look at the monitor there, the television, um, we will see that we are being telecast. Ta da! Telecast into Carrollton, Georgia. Hi, Ron. How many folks do we have in the audience? A grand total of five attendees this evening. How do you do, five wonderful folks in my family? Here I am from Carrollton. Ron was gracious enough to get us all set up with this. Uh, we are running through the internet on a free program called Skype. And we just wanted to demonstrate what a wonderful tool this could be. Guest saver, it's up and coming. Why it is not all over the place. It is my surprise and Ron's regret. We've been doing this through science fiction since I can remember talking on the picture uh, conferencing, but we know it's going to get snowballing here soon. If you want information on this type of telecast, um, there's handouts right there next to the television monitor. And I am glad that you came this evening. Uh, some people are scared of poetry. Some think it is too complex. Um, some thinks maybe it's just too hard to understand, that it's too long, that it's too so many different things. But I'm going to offer you a little point this evening. But first, a little bit of background. Uh, last summer, we had a poetry slam for our teens. And in order to get them here, we bribed them with pizza, as we often have to do with our teen group. Uh, maybe we should try that with the adults next time. But we had a fellow that wanted to participate, but he said he did not know a single point. And I wanted him to participate, so I, I made an agreement with him that if I would find him a point that he was comfortable with, because that was the deal, if you were coming and eating my pizza, you must be prepared to come and share a coin. Uh, and he certainly was up for the pizza, but not too comfortable about the poetry. So I asked him, you know, if I could help him find something, would he be willing to recite it? And he said he thought he could do that. Um, not only did he come and enjoy pizza and give a wonderful rendition of this poem, but he also later used it in a school project. So poetry touches even the most reluctant sometimes. Um, I will present to you this point. I wish I could credit the author. My best guess is it is Dean Coots, but I am not positive. The book that it was in is currently checked out, therefore I'm unsure. Uh, it has no title whatsoever, but it goes like this. I love you, I love you, I love you divine. Please give me your chewing gum. You're sitting on mine. And poetry can be so many things. It can be short and sweet as that one is. It can be funny. But it can be fun. And it can be a joy. And at this point in time, it is my great joy to introduce to you Miss Betty Candler. Uh, she is a Georgia native with a love of language. Not only did she win the Goodman Award for Excellence during her college years uh, at, Good, at Gordon Military College, uh, but she was also their valedictorian in the year 1900. <laughs> um, she earned her master's degree in English and taught in the Bremen School System for 39 years. She currently works with the Harrelson County Certified Literate Community Program and at Shorter College, but I suspect she feels a great deal of her spare time enjoying poetry. Betty, I'll send it to you. Thank you. Would you want to give me one of these things? I can tell them it's not to survive. I don't know that Carol can do it. No, they won't. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. It's a pleasure to be here. 
I love poetry, yes I do. And I agree with Jana in what she said. Some of what I have brought you tonight is short. Some of it is sweet. Some of it is funny. Some of it is sad. Some of it's a little bit longer. Some of it's a little bit deeper. Some of it's a little bit shallow. But it's all poetry. And it's all good. And I think most people have a poet in their hearts. And I like the little children's rhyme. I'm a poet. And my feet show it. They're long fellows. Some of us are poets and don't know it. And we need to find that in the poet soul. Because I think the soul is the poet in us. And so I have a variety of things that I thought I would share with you. We'll talk about poems that don't have any size, shape, or form. And we'll talk about poems that do have a size, a shape, or form. We'll talk about poems that rhyme. We'll talk about poems that don't rhyme. And I, like Jan, have a poem that I want to read you to start with that was written by one of my students at Brigham High School years ago. And on its original paper, it is quite yellowed with age, and it's unsigned. And for the life of me, after having graduated, <coughs> I cannot remember who wrote it. So I must apologize. But it's called Ridicule. And I think it would give you a little insight into maybe my classroom at the time. I always thought a poem should rhyme, but no, we never had the time. Hurry, get all your feelings out before they up and run away. I thought capitals were a must when a poem would just gather dust on an editor's dirty shelf just after I had found myself. But I'm just too logical and as stubborn as a bull to write the way new poets write. But maybe they have seen the light. Goodbye, meter and the like. Just write like a little tiny. New poets, you lit a fire. My English teachers just had a fit. And then the English teacher writes a little poetry on the side. And for the most part, it does not rhyme. For the most part. So I thought I'd start tonight by sharing just a few of my own. The first one I'm going to read to you is my one and only published poem because I just write them for myself. But this particular one was published in the National Teachers Anthology many years ago, 1974. It's entitled Beginning, and it's really about the end. She is a memory of youthful blindness, blue eyes, and energetic slenderness. A teacher, philosopher, preacher, doctor, psychologist, and expert in ESP. She answers the phone with, hi, I knew it was you. Someday, it won't be. She is gray, not so slender, still energetic, and her eyes have taken on the sparkling wisdom of age. She doesn't understand how some young folks think. She never will. She is a world alone, which allows unliked changes to affect only others. She's an old-time preacher on a soapbox about what this world's coming to. Maybe it isn't. Spanning my mind from whenever to whenever, she is much of what I am. Her hands have molded the clay of my life, and soon she may not be. Now, about whom is that written? That's my mom. <laughs> a, a great teacher, but more personal than that. Yeah, that's my mom. That's my mom. And this is about a friend I once had. <laughs> Notice once I had. And after I read the poem, you'll understand the problem with that. You know, we have all kinds of friends in the world. Some are true and some are false. Gifts is the title of this poem. They come in boxes of all shapes and sizes. They are gaily colored paper. They are flaming streamers of ribbon. They are love. They are not. They are mementos of special occasions. They are special occasions themselves. They are surprises. They are generosity. They are not. For her, 
they are reminders, not remembrances. For her there must be constant thank yous. For her there are always the I gave it to hers. They are brides. They are show. They lack feeling. They are love. Do you ever have a friend like that? Someone who's always reminding you of what they did? I think we all are. And I think this must have been just preying on me at the time because I wrote the same kind of attitude about facades, faults, faces, the pretenses that we wear sometimes. And all of us do. Shakespeare was the master of telling us this and reminding us this. He did it several times in different plays. But my favorite lines about it are, all the men and women merely players. Everyone's an actor. It says, who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. And we are. There's a little actor in everybody. Has to be. We have all kinds of different personalities. I always tell students at school, if your mother could see you acting that way, what would happen? If the principal saw you acting that way, what would happen? If your friends see you acting that way, we have different personalities for different people, different places, different times. Different behaviors, at least, if not personalities. She appears all smiles. Smiles are frowns. She appears all frowns. Frowns are smiles. The true feeling cannot be given. The opposites fight within her. Good battles bad. Bad is good. She wants to show approval, but something inside fights the instinct. Approval fights disapproval. Disapproval always seems to win. And this is one that I wrote years after I faced the first classroom. In retrospect, William Wordsworth is my favorite poet. I have to confess to that. Most of the time, English teachers never admit they have favorites, but we do. And I just don't mind it really. And he said that good poetry is the best and highest moments of man's reflected in moments of tranquility. In other words, it might be years later when you write about it. But if you thought it at the time, the memory is there and it will come back to you. So I wrote this about what it was like to face my first class ten years after I did. Years are spent in training, dreaming of a brilliant future. Interviews are suffered through and a position is finally found. Likes and dislikes are discussed and just the right spot is found. Days and weeks are spent in preparation for all the people who want knowledge. I enter a classroom for the first time and face a sea of blank faces. And what did I realize? That it was my job to light those faces up. That they weren't going to come there all lit up necessarily. And it took a long time to learn how to do that. So I hope I can still do that. And then we write about our family. How many of you write about family? Who keeps a journal? Write down the things that happen every day. I wrote this poem about my brother. He's never seen it. And I doubt he ever would. <laughs> because I'm not sure he'd appreciate it sometimes. But it's basically the truth. When we were little, we did not get along. But it's amazing how you change when you grow up. We had sibling rivalry. So I titled it Brother Friend. He was fist and angry words. He was everything that said no. He was a black eye. I hated him. He was my ticket. I challenged him to make the dean's list with me. We shared our books and friends. I liked him. He married in June. I married in December. He grew long hair and deserted us for California. I hated him again. He came home calm. He remarried. He settled down in the house we grew up in. He worked hard and became a detective. He became proud of himself and me again. Our differences disappeared. I love him. Did you ever go through those relationships? Fine line my grandmother taught me between love and hate. 
a very fine line. And then I want to move on to Emily Dickinson, who is also one of my favorite poetesses. Emily Dickinson, do you know much about her? The thing that fascinates me about Emily Dickinson is how little contact she had with the outside world because she became a recluse and was a recluse during most of the time when she wrote her poems. But how much insight she had into human nature and to God and the world of nature. And so her poetry is, to me, very inspiring. The first one I want to read to you is, is a face poem. It's called Chartless, meaning without a map. For her chart is a map. I never saw a war. I never saw the sea. Yet I know how the heather looks and what a way it must be. I never spoke of God, nor visited in heaven, yet certain am I of the spot, as if the chart were given. Can you identify with that? Places you've never seen, but you know they're there? You can close your eyes and you have your picture, you know what you believe. Emily Dickinson knew what she believed. This is my favorite library poem by Emily Dickinson, and I suspect that those of you who work in the library are quite familiar with this poem. It's called, There Is No Frigate Ship Like a Book. There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, nor any coursers like a page of prancing poetry. This traverse may the poorest take without oppressive toll. You don't have to pay for it. How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul. Do you ever pick up a book just to escape? Do you ever pick up a book to go where you know you will not ever physically go? Did you ever pick up a book to visit in the life of someone that you knew you would never know? There is no frigate like a book. And then I like this one for just crazy reasons, I suppose. It's called I'm Nobody. Because she was a recluse and she kept to herself all the time and she really had moments when she felt this way. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Shh, don't tell. They banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. To tell your name the live long day to an admiring God. And then this is one that I've recited to my children over the years. My grandmother recited it to me, my mother recited it to me, and I have recited it to my children when they misbehave. And it's about nature. It's called The Sky is Low, The Clouds Are Mean. Did you ever think about the clouds being mean when it's a thunderstorm? Uh, the sky is low, the clouds are mean. A traveling flake of snow across a barn or through a rut debates if it will go. A narrow wind complains all day how someone treated him. Nature, like us, is sometimes caught without her diadem. We are not always on our best behavior either. So nature mirrors that sometimes. Death is one of the most prominent topics in poetry. Agree? I think, for the most part, we write about the things that touch our human emotions the most deeply. Love, death, family, war, and the remainder of these poems cover all of those bases. And I want to start with death, so we can end on a happy note. Is that a good plan? Always start and build back up again. Emily Dickinson is the author of one of my favorite poems about death. Invariably, when I have really close friend who has a death in the family, I always hand write this little poem on a slip of paper and put it in the palm of person when I visit the funeral home. And it's called The Bustle in a House. The bustle in a house the morning after death is solemnest of activities enacted upon earth. The sweeping up the heart and putting love away we shall not want to use again until eternity. We seldom grieve for the dead, we grieve for our own loss, and that sweeping up the heart is a hard thing. And then she had the most wonderful outlook about death. 
She wrote two or three little poems about death that I dearly love. This is short, it's only four lines, but it says so much. And it's entitled simply that such have died. That such have died enables us, the tranquiller, to die. That such have lived, certificate for immortality. No doubt. Solid faith. No doubt whatsoever. Another set of poems about death that I have always dearly loved are from Wordsworth, New Wordsworth. And they are, as a group, entitled The Lucy Poems, which is interesting in and of itself. Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge together are the fathers of what's called the Romantic Movement in Poetry. The word romance, by dictionary definition, means adventure. It doesn't mean love, like we think about when we talk about romantic novels and things of that sort. Romance is adventure. Death is a great adventure. Loving someone is a great adventure. And having that person that one loves to die is probably the hardest of all adventures. And Wordsworth wrote five poems about a girl named Lucy. No one knows who Lucy was. As far as all the biographies, all the journals, all the notes from his sister Dorothy, there is no mention of a Lucy. So once upon a time, in a dark age with the dinosaurs, I wrote a research paper on who was Lucy. And I did not find an answer. But whoever Lucy was, she had to be real. Because I don't think a poet could have written these five poems quite the way they are had it not been a real thing. The first one's called She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Ways, which means she lived out in the country. She dwelt among the untrodden ways beside the springs of Dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love, a violet by a mossy stone half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but oh, the difference. This one is entitled, The Slumber Did My Spirit Seal, Lock Up My Spirit. Slumber is death. Sleep is death. Most of the time in poetry, if they talk about sleeping and slumbering, you're dying. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now. No force. She neither hears nor sees, roll round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. This one is called Strange Fits of Passion Have I Known. Strange fits of passion have I known, and I will dare to tell, but in the lover's ear alone, what once to me befell. When she I loved looked every day, fresh as a rose in June, I to her cottage bent my way beneath an evening moon. Upon the moon I fixed my eye all over the wide lea. With quickening pace my horse drew nigh, those paths so dear to me. And now we reach the orchard plot, and as we climb the hill, the sinking moon to Lucy's cot, cottage came nearer and nearer still. In one of those sweet dreams I slept, kind nature's gentlest moon, daydreams, and all the while I kept my eyes on the descending moon. My horse moved on to the after hook, he raised and never stopped, when down behind the cottage roof at once the bright moon dropped. What fond and wayward thoughts will slide into a lover's head? Oh, mercy to myself, I cried. And this particular poem has a footnote. Wordsworth originally ended this poem with another stanza, which in later years he decided to delete. The latter stanza says, I told her this, which implies that she was not dead. I told her this, her laughter light is ringing in my ears. And when I think upon that night, my eyes are dim with tears. 
So do you think he should have left it where he left it or kept this one? That's always the question. You like the footnote? I'm done. I don't know who Lucy is. Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm with you, though. Um, I will tell you a little bit about what I think, but I don't know that she died because we don't have the history of that. At one point in Wordsworth's life, he went to live in France during the French Revolution, which I think most people who study Wordsworth know. And he had an affair with a woman named Annette Leon, and they had a daughter whose name was Caroline. And I, my best guess was that something happened to that daughter. But I could never prove that either. Um, I'm sure there's someone out there watching this who has research and, the, and has delved more deeply than I was able to do in the years when I did it because we didn't have access to the technology to find things that you have now. But I don't know. And then, just for a change of pace and a little bit of a laugh, I am a huge fan of Ogden Nash, who was America's greatest limerick writer. And I love limericks. Limericks are actually named for Limerick, Ireland. They are an Irish poetry form. And I suspect that people sat around in the pubs, popping ale and making up little rhyming things. But Ogden Nash is a wonderful limerick writer. One of my favorite ones that used to be in a seventh grade literature book was about celery. Celery chewed. Celery stewed is more easily chewed, but celery raw develops the jaw. And he wrote all kinds of little funnies like that. So I brought you what I call a taste of Agu Nash. I've never seen an abominable snowman. I'm hoping not to see one. I'm also hoping if I do, that it will be a wee one. Now there were other limerick writers who liked to pick up Agu Nash's limericks and tweak them a little bit. Another great limerick writer is Gillette Burgess, and he wrote, in imitation of Ogden Nash's abominable snowman, The Purple Cow, and you've probably heard it. I've never seen a purple cow. I'm hoping not to see one, but I can tell you now I'd rather see than be one. And then sometimes Ogden Nash put a head note on some of his limericks. This particular little limerick starts with this statement, maybe you can't take it with you. But look what happens when you leave it behind. As American towns and cities I wander through, one landmark is constant everywhere I roam. The house that the banker built in 1902, dim neon, tells me is now a funeral home. Is it true? Yes. <laughs> For a long time it was. And then, some of you are not old enough to remember Burma Shea. But some of us are. In the Dark Ages, Burma Shea had signs all down the two-lane highways that had little rhymes on them. And you had to read each sign as you drove down the road, which was an extremely dangerous thing to do, actually. And so, Ivan Nash wrote this little limerick, and he entitled it, Lather, shaving cream, Lather as you go. Beneath this slab, John Brown is stowed. He watched the ads and not the road. Which leads me to another of my favorites, and I don't actually know who wrote this one. It was neither Gillette Burgess nor I could know. And it says, this is the grave of Michael Day, who died defending his right of way. His right was clear and his will was strong, but he's just as dead as if he'd been wrong. Which is true. Don't you think? Very true. And then, are you familiar with Sergeant Joyce Kilmer's poem, Trees? I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. Which concludes with, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And Ogden Nash picked up on that one and wrote, I think that I shall never see a billboard lovely as a tree. Indeed, unless the billboards fall, I will never see a tree at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then you wrote about mermaids. Now, how many of you like myths about mermaids? Society must like myths about mermaids. We're still making movies about mermaids. Ogden Nash wrote this, and he entitled it The Mermaid. Say not, the mermaid is a myth. I once knew one named Mrs. Smith. 
She stood while playing cards or knitting. Mermaids are not equipped for sitting. And that's the truth, isn't it? And then there's a little bit about love and passions and thoughts and things of that sort. And then we're going to see what you brought to read some, okay? From Poems of Passion by Ella Wilcox. And you've heard this, I'm sure. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. Rejoice and men will seek you. Grieve and they turn and go. They want full measure of your pleasure, but they did not want your woe. And I think that's because most of us have no more wrong. Right? <laughs> Would you think? Maybe? Possibly? This is called Outwitted by Edmund Markham, and it's another little four-line poem, but it's loaded with content. He drew a circle that shut me out. Parrot, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. And I love Edgar A. Guess. Without apology to the critics who think that Eddie Guest is shallow. I think had we more Eddie Guest poems in school these days, we'd have more children with a moral vision and an attitude that would be different. Edgar A. Guest wrote what's called didactic poetry. Didactic poetry is poetry designed to teach a moral lesson. That is its purpose. So it's perfectly all right for it to do that. But most critics don't like didactic poetry. They would rather it be a little obscure and that we had to work hard to figure it out. And that is good for expanding the mind, but it is not always necessary. The message can be quite clear and still have a profound impact. And I think this does. This is about education. I think that I would rather teach a child the joys of kindness than long hours to spend poring over multiple and dividend, how differing natures may be reconciled, rather than just how cost accounts are filed. How to live bravely to its end, rather than how one fortress to defend. Or how gold coins once gathered can be piled. There is an education of the mind, which all require, and parents early start. But there is training of a nobler kind, and that's the education of the heart. Lessons that are most difficult to give are faith and courage and the way to live. And this is Eddie Guess, my grief. To live as gently as I can. To be no matter where a man. To take what comes of good or ill and cling to faith and honor still. To do my best and let that stand record of my brain and mind. And then, should failure come to me, still work and hope for victory. To have no secret place within where I stoop unseen to shame or sin. To be the same when I'm alone as when my every deed is known. To live undaunted, unafraid of any step that I have made. To be without pretense or shame exactly what men think I am. To leave some simple mark behind to keep my having lived in mind. If enmity to all I show, then to be an honest, generous foe. To play my little part, nor whine that greater honors are not mine. This, I believe, is all I need for my philosophy and my creed. And here is what any guest wrote about when death comes. It's called compensation, which means the payoff, ultimately. I'd like to think when life is done that I could fill a needed post, that here and there I'd paid my fare with more than idle talk and boast, that I had taken gifts divine, the breath of life and man could find, and tried to use them now and then in service for my fellow men. I hate to think when life is through that I have lived my rounded years, a useless kind that leaves behind no record in 
and his veil of tears. Then I had wasted all my days by treading only selfish ways, and that this world would be the same if it had never known my name. I'd like to think that here and there, when I am gone, there shall remain a happier spot that might not have existed had I toiled for gain. That someone's cheery voice and smile shall prove that I have been worthwhile. That I have paid with something fine my debt to God for this life divine. And then there's love. We must be a little love. The night has a thousand eyes and the day but one. Yet the whole light of the world dies with the dying sun. The mind has a thousand eyes and the heart but one. Yet the light of the whole world dies when love is done. And then on a happier note, Anne Bradstreet, great American Puritan mother of 11 children, wrote her poetry, for the most part, on a sick bed near a window in her home. It was taken by her brother to England, and he had it published without the permission. Puritans did not believe in poetry. It was too frivolous, too emotional, too light, not nearly stoic enough for the Puritan way of life. But she wrote many poems about her family, and this one is uh, one that was made famous by Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. In school, we used to memorize poetry all the time. And I find, as I go around and talk to schools now, that that isn't happening everywhere. I wish it were. If we can memorize the lyrics for today's music, we need to memorize the poem too. I the path of that one. So, when Jimmy and Rosalind Carter were high school sweethearts in the 11th grade in Plains, Georgia, they memorized this particular poem. It was a class assignment. When he was elected president of the United States, she had it set to music and it was sung in his inauguration. So you never know when you memorize a poem in the 11th grade how much it might be to you in the course of life. And it's simply called to my dear and loving husband. It is a sonnet that is 14 lines of iambic pentameter rhyme. It is a fixed form poem. If ever two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by wife, then thee. If ever wife was happy in a man, compare with me, ye women, if you can. I prize thy love more than whole mines of gold, or all the witches that the east doth hold. My love is such that rivers cannot quench, nor aught but love from thee be recompense. Thy love is such I can no way repay. The heavens reward thee, man, for all thy pray. Then while we live in love, let's so persever that when we live no more, we may live ever. And then if you're a fan of the movie Dead Poet Society, if you never met this poem anywhere else, you meet it in Dead Poet Society. And a lot of students memorize it as a result of watching that movie. It's called She Walks in Beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best in light and dark in her aspect, in her eyes. Thus mellow to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, and half impaired the nameless grace that waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face. Where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek and o'er that brow so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that blend tents that glow, but tell a days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. And this has to be the most famous love poem in all the world. It is from the Sonnets of the Portuguese by Elizabeth Barrett Browning in Sonnet number 43, and it's simply entitled, How Do I Love You? You can buy it every year on Hallmark Park. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. 
I love thee with the love I seem to lose when my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better. I want to share trees with you because it's a war poem. This is this is really a battlefield poem. Sergeant Joyce Hill. This is a Joyce who was a gentleman in World War II. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And then there is no poetry reading without Robert Frost. <laughs> this is always, I mean, there has to be a frost, doesn't there? <laughs> Love, Robert Frost. There was a television show years ago that used this poem I, I have been one acquainted with tonight as its prologue to every show. For the life of me, I can't even remember the name of the show. But everyone who hears this poem that's my age or older will say, oh, that was on a television show. And yes, it was. There's a dark side, always. I have been well acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his feet and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet. When far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. Not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed that the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been acquainted. And then one that I think everybody does memorize in school still sometimes. And then I find that they look. <laughs> it's called Stopping by Woods on a Snow Evening. How many of you memorize Stopping by Woods on a Snow Evening at some point in your life? Okay. Um, this is a wonderful poem. And it's one that we use to teach how to interpret a piece of poetry. Because it is full of clues and so open to multiple interpretations. For example, there is or used to be professor at the University of Georgia. I don't know if he's still there, but one of my former students came back to visit one day and said, Ms. Campbell, you will not believe this, but our professor said that Stopping by Woods is a poem about Santa Claus. And I said, well, let's look at the Is there enough information? to substantiate the idea that that is about sound. Listen to it. See if it agrees. Are we okay now? Yeah. Okay. I think so. First of all, get the setting. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. My favorite lines, the only other sound is the sweep of easy wind and down the cliff. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep. Miles to go before I sleep, and 
miles to go before I sleep. So now you tell me, how is it sound loss? What is, where, where's the evidence? Okay, the longest night, or the darkest night of the year. Yes, Christmas Eve, yeah. dead of winter. Yes, it is. Miles to go before I sleep. Promises is the key. Promise is the key. All those toys, those toys. And there's something in the middle of that house nearby. No houses nearby. Yeah. What do you know about the original St. Nicholas? Would he have had reindeer and sleigh? Or would he have had horse and wagon? Bells? Jingle bell? Sure, there's plenty of evidence. But that's the surface of this poem, don't you think? Well, that's interesting. <laughs> And that's one of the wonderful pleasures of poetry is that each reader mm -hmm. can bring something to the conversation about a piece of poetry. Mm -hmm. And one really should never just look at a student or anybody else, a friend, if you're just reading them with friends in the eye and say, no, you're wrong. You, you ask, well, what in the poem made you think that? And so whenever I'm teaching analysis of poetry, I always ask students to find the evidence. I'll just say you think it means I find your evidence. Because it may not mean that at all. And one last one, and then I'm going to let you read to me. Mending Wall, one of my favorite poems. Because I don't think it's just about the wall between the two pieces of land. Let's see what you think. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that sends the frozen ground and swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass through abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made a pair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbits out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring, mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers to the bone. We're just a handful of them. Oh, it's just another kind of outdoor game on one on the side. It comes to a little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am all apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom it was likely to give offense. Something there is that does not love a wall, that wants it now. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing the stone, grasped firmly by the top of each hand, like an old stone, savage arm. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me. Not of the woods only, in the shade of the trees. He will not go behind his father, saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make the news. So what do you think he's talking about with the walls? Not, not a thing.
physical construction that the emotion falls. The emotional falls. Yeah. The emotional falls. How many of you are music fans? What music do you want? Hmm? Everything. Everything? A little bit of everything? Lots of different. All of the lyrics to all of the songs are poetry. Lyric is a form of poetry. So the words to the songs are poems. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear the same kinds of things reiterated in popular songs because human nature is a constant thing no matter what its surroundings. Something does not like a law. And it's mostly the laws that we build between ourselves. That something doesn't function. You know, we break ourselves up sometimes because it's a protection of something. So that's a really neat poem, worthy of going back and reading again a few thousand times. Um, every time I read it, I think about it a little bit. And that's one of the nice things about poetry. It isn't a read it once kind of thing. So, what did you bring to read? I'm going to step down and let you have this fun. I hope you to be honest, I'm not sure Bob or Bob or swapping you. So I was going to say, I'm not I'm just saying. <laughs> well, but we can't see them doesn't necessarily mean that you they can't see us. us. It looks like we dropped the call. And, and so I don't know if we're still... You know what? We're not able. If you if you get yeah, our So we've become a little. We've lost our call. It's, it's, it's almost yeah, just a little tiny. <laughs> it's almost eight, and I think he said he would need to shut down there about seven fifty. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, 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 no. 